Greetings, everyone, and welcome once again to yet another edition of The Urban Algorithm. I'm Wayne Gilman with you on this beautiful Saturday afternoon here in the New York area. And uh, we are, of course, on the Our World Media Network every week, and uh, our purpose here is trying to solve some of the problems of the community by coming up with some ideas, rules, if you will. That's why I call it The Algorithm, and hopefully it'll come to a solution like it would in math. Uh, for those who don't know, because I was questioned about that. Anyway, just the same, we're going to hit the ground running this week, backed by popular demand, the retired chief of police here in New York, Wilbur Bill Chapman, is with us. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good afternoon, Wayne. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, always a pleasure to have you back. And, uh, you know, there's so much that has gone on. I mean, the purpose of having this segment was about minority police recruitment, uh, particularly as it pertains to the Long Island area and the rest of the country. But of course, yesterday we got the uh, the 411 with respect to the sentence of Derek Chauvin. And I'm going to begin with that because I'm certain most people would want to understand your beliefs. You know, you haven't been uh, a member of the department for such a long time, and you know, walking the street, rising up within the ranks. How does it feel, I mean, when you saw what went down? Well, it's clear that the justice system worked. However, it's unfortunate that uh, this particular individual wasn't singled out and removed from the department before he could do the fatal harm that he did to Mr. Floyd. Uh, in retrospect, you know, police need to police themselves better because obviously with his disciplinary record, uh, he clearly had a tendency that if he hadn't been stopped, he was going to continue to uh, act in a way that was not in the best interest, certainly of the department, and moreover, in, in terms of the public, that the department is sworn to serve. So the, 20, the 22 and a half years uh, doesn't replace Mr. Floyd's life, but the process itself where the police chief and other members of the department came out to testify against the police officer uh, shows progress in the fact that instead of circling wagons and defending someone who was involved in illegal conduct, uh, there are those in policing who will remove an individual like that from their ranks. Well, many in the community seem to be very upset with, uh, with regard to the fact that he only got uh, 22 and a half, which actually breaks down to, what, 15, I understand? I think it's, I think it's about 15 and get with good behavior. Uh, however, I can understand the outrage of the community, uh, because of the fact, you know, this man committed murder, and mm. there is no way to rationalize it. Uh, but listening to the prosecutor's summation and the, and the judge's charge uh, during the sentencing, it was a difficult decision for people who normally don't view black lives as same as their own uh, to come out with such a verdict. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's a very small step. Right, right. You said something earlier on about police not uh, doing a great job of policing themselves, and a lot of people say that's been the issue. Um, I, I hope that there's never going to be another Derek Chauvin again. We know that there are bad actors out there. Um, what is the best way, in your opinion, you know, given your experience, to, to, to preclude this from actually happening a second time? Well, I hate to... to, to quote Rudy Giuliani, especially considering his current antics, mm -hmm. but the fish rots from the head. Police take their direction from the elected official who is in charge of hiring the police chief. And if that individual believes that all people should be treated with respect and dignity, then that will filter down. If that person is only interested in political expedience or not particularly sensitive to those who are culturally different, then you're gonna have problems. And that's institutionally what's been wrong with policing. You have people in those ranks who don't belong and no one does anything to remove them or discipline them or train them to get them to act appropriately. And as a result, you have this continuing, uh, this continuation of the policy of rogue officers doing something wrong. And then it's, it's an individual bad actor and all police must pay for that. The overall number of majority of police officers are dedicated, hardworking, decent individuals. However, if they don't speak out about those in their ranks that don't belong, all police will suffer. 
Well, you know, as you mentioned that, that we're about to, uh, to, to, to weigh into the recruitment uh, situation, but I also find that as a result of what happened yesterday, uh, it's, it's not new, new news that uh, a lot of the uh, members of police forces around the country are beginning to retire early and, and quit. Do you think that uh, is a factor because of... Um, the, the fact that they no longer feel that they're immune or there's this effort to, to get away with um, the uh, immunity that they've once uh, enjoyed all those years. You know, I think there's been a, uh, a decline. There, there, obviously, there are a lot of people who signed up for uh, policing in various uh, municipalities around the country, and uh, there have been reports that uh, a lot of them are now, you know, they look at the, the process of having to work X amount of years, and they don't want it anymore, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, changes that society's looking for, you know, and uh, qualified immunity is a big issue. I mean, it's not no longer rubber stamped that it's expected in every uh, every department. So I, I just wanted to think about, I wanted to hear your thoughts about what you felt would uh, perhaps put a stop to that if it's to happen. Well, I've always maintained that if the police refuse to police themselves, other people that don't know as much about policing will police them and you see it with the advent of body cameras because body cameras are a statement of we don't trust the police we want some video verification uh, every police chief every police supervisor and every police officer in this country knows who the good cops are and who are those that don't belong and until there is a dedicated comprehensive way of preventing people from like that like that from getting into policing and those within the ranks be removed we're going to continue to have problems uh, also police officers and the police departments have to start to realize that they reflect the communities that they serve whether they're commuter police or occupational armies is a question of how they recruit to get people who reflect the community within their ranks and the more people you have who reflect the community, the more effective you can be and the less likely you are to have people who are culturally dissimilar and who are culturally insensitive. Well, it seems like some departments, especially here in the metropolitan area, just recently we had a, a, a big uh, pushback from uh, local officials about recruitment in certain, uh, and I speak primarily of Nassau County for one, but I know it's global. Uh, your thoughts on what was happening there, you know, why is it that it's so difficult to find candidates who look like us to be participants in the process of uh, becoming police officers? It's not difficult if you want to find them. Uh, if you look at, if going back in history to Mayor Dinkins, who wanted the police department to reflect the go gorgeous mosaic he thought New York City was, he tasked his police commissioner, Raymond Kelly, to go out and find qualified people. And Kelly spent a lot of times in churches, in colleges, uh, with the military, looking for people who look like those in the city and reflect the population who are qualified to be police officers. And we found I was part of that recruitment drive as a commanding officer. And it turned out that the higher uh, you looked uh, in terms of education, in terms of experience, the more diversity you found. Uh, and that when you lowered uh, your expectations, doing street corner recruitment and other things that really don't bring in the best candidates, uh, the less diversified you become. And that's unpopular. And particularly here in, you know, in, in New York, there is no excuse for not finding qualified people of, of all cultures. They are there, they're clearly available and you have to sell them on policing and get them to understand that by joining the police department, they make a difference in their community. The best recruiters for policing are other police officers. And if the majority of your police officers are going to be from one ethnic group, you're gonna to continue to have the majority of your recruits from that ethnic group. The idea is to reach out and make people welcome, explain to them the benefits of being part of keeping their community safe. And the average person will say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is something I should consider. Instead of making blanket statements uh, that are dismissive, and say, well, I can't do this, because that's the same mentality that says I can't police those within my ranks.
You know, it's, it's amazing as you mentioned that and you said that the quality of one's uh, education is so important. I found, uh, just doing some research, that even in Nassau County, which I believe pays even more than what the NYPD is paying uh, at the start, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but they only have as a prerequisite a, a, a high school degree, uh, a diploma. Um, not saying that anyone who's gone through four years to get a bachelor's and beyond saying, you know, that they fit the criteria of somebody who's balanced and normal, because I've run across a few people who haven't come out that <laughs> way, but... You know, at the very least, I figured if you got out of high school, you know, you have some time to marinate, you know, question whether, you know, enjoy what it's like to be a part of society before making a decision about joining the force. Well, I agree with you. I had some people work for me who had PhDs that couldn't pass a sergeant's exam. Uh, it just shows their <laughs> aptitude was, was in a different area. It, it's, it's, it's very clear. Well, everybody makes more money than New York City police officers. Let's, Is that they're right? Probably the yeah, they're, they're probably one of the, the worst paid departments in the country, and Pat Lynch didn't pay me to say that. That's a reality. Uh, Nassau County is one of the higher paid police departments. However, there isn't the same of cult, this, there isn't the same cultural pressure to integrate that department the way there was in New York City. When you had a mayor and you had a city council that wanted people who reflected the community and their electorate to be in the police department, it got done. When you have 11% of your electorate as African American, there is no moral or, or, or uh, political imperative upon the county executive to move in that direction. Uh, there was one county executive that hired an African American police commissioner. That lasted for a little while, and it didn't change the culture. Not that the culture is necessarily bad, it's just not inclusive. And if you want to be uh, proactive, and get better quality people, you look in colleges and you look in places where there are other options for particularly African-Americans. Uh, African-American males are an endangered species in terms of being wanted in policing because anybody who's sharp gets sucked up by another industry who will pay them more. And it, it takes someone who has a level of dedication or a desire to be a police officer to pass up the other opportunity and come into policing. So, you know, there has to be a real desire to bring people in. And obviously there wasn't from the statements that were made and from uh, abs absolutely no change in the policy out there. Mm. And, and, and the thing is, some of the statements that are made were so racist on the part of the department <laughs> head. You know, I, I, I'm sitting there when I first heard I was driving along. I forgot where I was. But the bottom line is it was so profound that I, I, I felt like stopping my car and, and, and just processing what I just heard because I couldn't believe that somebody who runs a department in an affluent area of New York, Nassau County, you know, certainly doesn't have the dregs of society. There may be some elements like that out there, but the vast majority of people living in Nassau County in New York, you know, make $5 and they have it well buried in their <laughs> pockets and stuff like that. And I'm just speaking metaphorically, but but the bottom line is is that for you to come out and make a statement and then supported on top of that by the county exec, you know, I just said to myself, you know, they're really turning the clock back out here. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I, I felt immediately uncomfortable. You know, well, well, you know, it's it's very nice. For, if I remember correctly, I don't think the county executive actually made a statement there was a press release, which says a whole lot. You know, uh, I can't fault the commissioner because he is who he is. And if those are his beliefs, he's had those beliefs for his entire life. And in vetting him for that job, it was, became obvious or should have been obvious to the county executive that those were his thoughts and his feelings. So therefore it wasn't important to her because if she felt that that was an inappropriate remark, or she didn't agree with them tacit or tacitly approve of them, mm -hmm. she would have come out in in a, in a stark uh, rebuttal and say, "No, that's not what we're about." And obviously, she didn't because you know the eleven percent of the people who don't look like her in a county don't matter unless she has a you know unless she has a very stiff opponent, and then perhaps she'll come out and do some tokenism uh, and say, "We'll try." But you know that's not really uh, the way to do effective government, and that sends a horrible message 
uh, not only to, not only to the African Americans who serve in the Nassau County Police Department, but for the people who pay very high taxes in that county and expect a little better performance than that from their county executive. You know, I don't blame the police because the police work for the political head. David Dinkins didn't tolerate that. Uh, Mike Bloomberg set a tone. It might not have been good with stop and frisk, but he set a tone and he paid for that tone later. I think the reality is the county executive, Nassau County, should pay for that remark, not the police commissioner, because he's just doing his job. But whatever he says reflects what her thinking, that's the perception as far as I'm Absolutely. concerned. That's what I came away with. Oh, I agree with you completely. That's clear. That's clearly her perception. And the reality is she should be held accountable. You know, asking her to fire him is asking you to fire your sound engineer uh, because you said something inappropriate. It's mm -hmm. just not logical. It defies logic. She clearly feels that way and is using the police commissioner's statements as cover. That's wrong. Absolutely wrong. When uh, Rudy Giuliani called David Dinkins a washroom attendant, we were up in arms. And mm -hmm. there was a huge pushback. And that said, we will not tolerate that kind of statement or behavior. The same thing should happen from all the responsible political officials in Nassau County. You can't tolerate somebody saying that and allowing that philosophy to be prevalent in policing. But the reality is, if, if, you, if you know Nassau County, uh, the police commissioner is a titular figurehead. The union head runs the Nassau County Police Department. So the police should be to the union head, hey, why don't you go out and get more people of color and bring them in the department? Because obviously uh, the police commissioner can't and the county executive won't. Okay, so that is so radically different from what goes on in New York. I'm amazed what you said earlier that uh, the NYPD has the lowest paying uh, uh, jobs uh, in, in terms of what goes on across the country. It's amongst the lowest paying uh, departments in the country. I lived in Lakeview at a time when, when Nassau County was not the most uh, welcoming for people of color. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for that battle if necessary. Gotcha. Uh, I was trying to say uh, uh, that the New York City Police Department is shocking that the pay scale is not uh, the same as, as it is in most places. You know, not just uh, Nassau and Suffolk County, but a around the country, it's the lowest, you say, amongst it's, the yeah, it, it's It's really low in comparison to major cities and to the amount of work that's being done. And I never quite understood it. The political explanation was, well, we don't want to raise uh, the property taxes uh, on middle class and homeowners in New York City, so we, we can't afford to pay the police more. Uh, the reality is uh, there are companies, huge companies that are in New York that don't pay any taxes. So mm -hmm. tax them and give that money to the police. Uh, and if you're concerned about the police, then raise the standards, as the department has, to get better quality police officers in. But it has never been an issue. Uh, going back to John Lindsay, uh, during a police strike in 1970, where Lindsay decided that there was no longer going to be uh, a pay scale that made the police exceptional in comparison to other uh, into other uh, cities' police departments, and basically from that time on, uh, there were mediocre rises in pay. But but they're not paid what they're worth, not at all. I, I happen to agree now. I, I mean, I was aware that it wasn't anywhere near like Mass or Suffolk, but I thought it was within striking distance, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of starting out. And I'd rather pay higher taxes for a disciplined, well-informed, well-educated police department in, in New York City as opposed to paying water taxes, for instance, which used to be free. <laughs> you know, pretty soon we're going to be taxed for breathing, you know. So, I mean, it, it, it just destroys, you know, the whole concept of uh, having lower pay when you have to pay for things like that. Wouldn't you agree? Well, it's it's you know it's it's difficult because again, uh, the police are the dentists of society, and 
no one really wants them until there's a problem. Now that crime is out of control, everyone wants the police to do something. Well, you know, this is a battleship. It doesn't turn on a dime. It takes a while for a bureaucracy uh, or, or a large agency to get control of all, of all of the external factors that affect its performance. And there is no doubt that if police officers were recruited better, trained better, paid better, uh, the results would be much more beneficial to the people of the city of New York. But you have to have someone in City Hall with the political commitment to do that. And you don't often get that. Uh, we've had mayors, and I've been around since Mayor Lindsay, we've had mayors that were very concerned with the police, and we had mayors that really weren't, and treated the police like stepchildren, and didn't really look at the impact that public safety has on economics and, and the quality of life in the city. And if you don't pay attention to that, you have no city. And right now we're on the precipice of an election uh, change. You're in that season again where we uh, uh, have a, a, a mayoral contest that will come up in November. And we had uh, primaries the other day, and it looks like one of your former colleagues uh, seems to be nearing the uh, the top, and he has a few thoughts about making changes. I don't know if you had the chance to, to look into that. Well, changes it's, it's, with respect know, to the police. Well, it's it's interesting. Anyone who doesn't think that there that there shouldn't be constant change and improvement in policing really doesn't get it. It's an evolving and, and constantly changing society, and the police must evolve and, and stay up to those changes in order to protect those in society. Uh, I think the primary results say one thing. Obviously, the, the majority of the people of the city of New York do not want to defund the police and do not despise the police. What they want is the police for the police to work better and more efficiently but also more respectfully. So you know, that's, you know, that's a core issue, and I think that came out. However, if you look at the results, uh, based upon the number of people that voted, uh, seven in 10 people uh, who voted in the Democratic primary wanted somebody other than the leading candidate. And that's going to be an issue mm. in the general election, if not in the recounts or, or the ranked choice voting selection of the second and third uh, place candidates. So there are issues there. There's also an issue with whether or not uh, all of those people who, who support the other two candidates are going to vote for Republican or not. So, that, you know, this, you know, uh, as they said in football, the fat lady hasn't sung yet, so this isn't over. Uh, but if this election will bring about an improvement in the way police function and the way government works, that's fine. I have my concerns, and so do others, that this may be just de Blasio 2.0 and not a real change. You know, and I, I'm beginning to lean towards that. I haven't really give, uh, come up with a final analysis of what I've been witnessing, but I tell you one thing, uh, living in the city of New York is not as comfortable as it used to be. There's been so much crime, so many shootings, and uh, the current mayor has come up with a plan to involve the ATF. And um, I don't know how much good they will do. A lot of them probably are not even familiar with the landscape here. Well, you know, it's, it's nice. It's, and all of a sudden, it's 1995 all over again. He just discovered the wheel. Uh, there, were, there was a real problem in the Bronx with, with shootings in 1995. And the Bronx DA, the assistant U.S. attorney, a number of very talented detectives and the detective commander in the Bronx decided to put together a program that brought in federal, that caused federal days, which meant if you got arrested for a gun in the Bronx, you did federal time, which is serious time, not state time. And it went a long way to correcting uh, some of the problems that existed in the Bronx. I was surprised that it didn't spread through the other boroughs because it was truly a good strategy. Bringing in the ATF is wonderful, but you know now we're now now we're locking the bond bond door after the animals have escaped. So I don't really you know I don't really put a lot of faith in in the outgoing administration because it it shows me as an African American what Democrats do wrong. They promise the world when until they're elected they do nothing and then they come back four years later and they say I'm going to fight for you some more and I have to finish my work. And yeah, I'm going to close Rikers Island, but it'll take 10 years, but I'm only going to be here for four. So excuse me if I'm cynical about that, but I think New Yorkers have to really question 
and hold their elected officials accountable for their actions or their lack thereof. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have crime in the streets, uh, roadways that look like third world countries. I take a particular interest in that because I was a DOT commissioner for two years. And when I left the city and came back, it looked like uh, Manhattan was a third world country the way the, the roads were almost impassable. And it's great. You want to put, you want to promote bicycling. You know, that's, that's wonderful. But you also have to share the road with trucks and, and, and pedestrians and other things. So I, I think there's, you know, I, to quote Catherine Garcia, there was an A for uh, conception and a failure for execution. And that's what's wrong with New York City. And we can't afford to have that continue in probably what would have been, continue to be the greatest city uh, in the world. And it's not anymore. And, and it's for reasons of political failure. Well, well, a moment ago, you said that uh, Democrats, they come and go and they don't seem to be focused. Are you suggesting that a Republican administration would do better? No, I'm suggesting that the whole political system fails. The Republicans have decided they want to be the party of the white aggrieved individual because the minorities are getting everything. You know, let's forget about the, the, the huge corporations that don't pay any taxes. Uh, so they've dismissed us. The Democrats say, where else can you get, you know, where else do you have to go? You have to, you have to be with us. You know, Chuck Schumer comes in and he sings, I love New York in one part of Brooklyn while people are getting killed in the other part of Brooklyn, never making, <laughs> never saying a word about it. Uh, we've got another U.S. Senator who's worried about rape in the military while people are being raped in New York and there are hate crimes, hasn't said a word there either. So politicians create an environment where either the th city will thrive or it will fail. And our politicians have failed us. That's why we have failing schools, we have failing policing, and it's if we continue to elect more of the same, we're going to get more of the same. Mediocre schools, homeless people, people shot in the streets, and that's where the Democrats have let us down because we as a people vote for them and they don't deliver. And I keep hearing within recent weeks like an escalation of talk about bringing back stop, question, and frisk. Is that the okay. answer? Okay. Stop, question, and frisk is the law. You can't make it go away. You can't, you, you can't make it stay. It is the law. It's ter Terry versus Ohio. And it says when a police officer believes, has reasonable suspicion that someone has committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime, they have the absolute right to question them. And if during that questioning they see an object that could be a weapon on the individual that could be injurious to the officer or an innocent person, they have the right to conduct a frisk. That's the law. You can't change the law. What went wrong was the, the application of that where you're searching uh, 500,000 people and, and for absolutely no reason other than you're searching 500,000 people. Mike Bloomberg didn't save anybody's life by having half a million people of color stopped. If I had implemented as the chief of patrol stop, question, and frisk for every white guy on Wall Street who had a briefcase because we thought cocaine was in it, that policy would have been ended in 15 minutes. But because it affected black and brown people, it went on for years and years and years. And instead of Ray Kelly's legacy being he prevented another attack on New York City by putting together a great kind of terrorism mechanism, his legacy is he was the guy that misused stop, question, and frisk, and the courts had to stop him. That was very bad policing. It set back the relationship between the police and community for years, and it's been really, it's, it, it's a policy that can work, it's the law, but it has to be used judiciously and appropriately. No more surgical policing and, and all these other terms. The reality is, if a guy is casing a jewelry store at four in the morning and it's closed, you have a right to ask him what he's doing. If someone is getting off the train at six o'clock at night, you really don't have a reason to stop them. I understand. And unfortunately, we're out of time, Bill. I want to thank you again. You speak your mind. And the fact, one of the reasons why I stay out of Texas is because of the element and the perception of stop. <laughs> <laughs> and all those in Texas, you don't have to have me back anytime soon, particularly Austin. <laughs> but that's another story. This is the Our World Media Network. We'll be back with the second half of our program after that, after this. Thank you, Bill. All right. Bill Chapin, retired New York City police chief.
Greetings once again. This is the Our World Media Network. Good afternoon. Wayne Gilman with you on the Urban Algorithm. And we have a very special guest, someone we've been trying to get on, even though the show is brand new for quite some time. We have an author all the way from the what they call the Big D. I don't know if they still refer to Detroit, Michigan as the Big D, but that has been ingrained in my head. I used to work with a disc jockey some years ago who came from Detroit, and all you ever talked about was the Big Well, you're in New York now, so what are you talking about the Big D about? Anyway, our special guest for this hour is author Michelle Parazon. Good afternoon, Michelle. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Awesome. I was concerned. Yeah. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing us this time. I know your schedule has been busy and I've had such difficulty getting you on, but we're grateful to have you here. And well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you finally. <laughs> finally. Yes, yes. You know, and I hope I'm not breaking uh, your, or discouraging your thoughts because I'm a radio face. I tell everybody that I have a very self-effacing humor, but uh, you have a subject that is near and dear to my heart and for all the years that I've been around, and that is dating. And, and there seems to be an ethic, an ethical question these days with respect to that. The name of your book is Loving Me, and originally it was Loving Me and Blocking Him, and yes. you just recently changed it to Loving Me and Blocking Them. Yes. And uh, I'm going to ask you right off the bat, why did you change the, uh, the title? I changed the title because I wanted to be sure that the title was not an impediment or um, a deterrent from anyone who wants the contents to be accessible, the information within the book to be available to them. Um, I got some feedback, not on the content, the, 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 the content um, feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, but there were a few people, gentlemen who were saying, oh my gosh, here's another book bashing guys. And I didn't want to give anyone that impression because that is not at all what the book does. Um, I wanted it to be uh, title friendly so that it would draw, you know, readers in as opposed to repelling them before they had a chance to open the book. <laughs> so that's why I changed the title of the book. Okay. And your reasons for writing the book. So my reasons for writing the book um, are, are varied, but primarily because um, I, I was an educator for several years. Um, I recently reti retired and I'm now working as the um, executive vice president of Digital Detroit Media, which is a marvelous um, advertising agency here in mm -hmm. Detroit, which services um, bland, brands rather locally and globally. Um, but for many years, I was a teacher and I was one of the go-to people in whatever school I was teaching in, you know, kids would seek me out, ask me advice about a number of things, but moreover, or more often than not, it had to do with their relationship challenges and, you know, why guys were not responding the way they thought the guys should respond. And a lot of times young men would come to me too and say, oh my gosh, you know, what am I supposed to do because she's not hearing me? So after so many years of explaining myself and re-explaining myself and thinking that everybody was okay and then they would come back with the same types of questions, I said, you know what, I'm just going to put this in a book. I'm going to put it where you will have a resource that you can go to so that if I'm not available to answer your questions based on the multiple conversations we've had, you have a tool, you have a guide. And that was the inspiration behind writing the book. Uh, I'm very much concerned about um, young women and their um, making themselves a priority in their lives. A lot of times um, young women don't do that. They look to external uh, sources to um, affirm who they are. And, and that's really not healthy for them. You really have to love you and focus on you and be about you. And so those are the reasons I wrote the book. And when I went through the book, um, I, I got the impression that it was basically, as you just cited, a template for young people to, 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 to basically get advice, you know, without having to call you and all that. But I also, you know, when I was going through it, I, I was looking back at a time when I was coming up, coming out of school, and some of the issues, of course, we're going back to the ancient uh, days when we're Stone Age, and uh, <laughs> dating, I'd like to still think, is still basically the same. What is so different today other than texting and social media, which I think has had a big impact? 
I think that one of the things that makes this era so different uh, for individuals who are young, young women in particular, um, and guys too, is, is the impact that social media has on um, so much of their lives, you know, their perceptions about what beauty is, um, you know, trying to make connections in a virtual world as opposed to having in-person conversations, just having conversations. You know, so many people these days text each other um, as opposed to having voice to voice um, or in-person conversations. And that is not the best way to get a read on the person you are, um, you know, attempting to connect with or giving them a true perception um, about who you are. So social media, a lot of what, you know, people, you know, how many likes am I getting? How many um, thumbs up am I getting? You know, tends to drive the way uh, many people, um, you know, view their value and worth. And it's, it's not, that's not where it should come from. You know, you should be good with you. So um, that's one of the things that's made things very, very different. I think that um, the impact that um, image, images and media have had on all of our lives has changed, you know, the perception about many things, um, dating notwithstanding, but just in general. You know, I, I just, you know, want us to get back to or want the young ladies to get back to just spending time with themselves, you know, looking themselves in the mirror and saying, you know, this is who I am. This is how I look. Uh, I'm good with me. You know, I want to be my best friend. I want to get to know myself. And um, because you can't be good with anybody else until you're good with you. I so. agree. And that goes with both uh, sexes, uh, male and female. I think there's a there's a self-esteem issue. And I think that there are. I, I see a lot of people, they turn to social media looking for an answer through somebody else's lenses. And, yes. uh, and I think that's largely part of the problem. And, and I agree with you that there should be more physical interaction over the phone if need be. I mean, that's the only thing yes. that would be an impediment. But I think, you know, I come up at a time and I gather you're probably around, well, I would say you're a lot younger than I am. Physically, you know, my but, mother would say twenty-one plus. So I'm uh, going with okay. that. Okay, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, I'm just around the corner from that plus several decades. But at the same time, I still think physical contact. When I was a child, and you know, just getting to meet someone was difficult in itself. Just as a male trying to find the courage. Uh, I know you know my cousin Brenda very well, Brenda Gilman Peak. Uh, if she I happens love her. to be, yes, she's yeah, amazing. She's, she's a great lady. That's like my big aunt. <laughs> but uh, the deal is, is that growing up in Brooklyn uh, was very difficult. You know, you met somebody in the subway. Some of us guys would hang by a particular park at a particular uh, subway station, and and the best dressed woman, the most elegant person, would be someone that we would approach, never mind the fact that we were inadequately uh, uh, presenting ourselves by the, the manner of our dress. You know, mm -hmm. some of us had sneakers and uh, jeans on, and here it is, you're meeting somebody, trying to meet someone, create an impression on someone after coming out of work, and just because they look good, you know, we ne it never dawned on us, at least some of the guys that I used to hang out with, that, you know, we had to have or have to offer something, you know, so it would be a reciprocal uh, process. Mm -hmm. And today it just seems like everybody's on, uh, as you mentioned, texting. And, 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 and what I think is even more of a problem is the lack of respect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? I, I, I do agree with that. And I, I'd like to say, um, first of all, with regard to young men, I, I'm so supportive of our guys. And in the book, I you know, have different um, segments throughout the book, which reads, you know, what guys have to say, because a lot of young men really don't always know how to be whom we expect them to be because they haven't had anyone to give them the guidance. And they're very forthcoming about that when they talk to me, you know, my dad wasn't around. So I'm not really sure what the um, do's and don'ts are, but a lot of times women just expect us to be what we perceive men should be able to be what we think they ought to be able to be. So in your case, yeah, you guys were hanging around, you know, trying to get the attention of, you know, the beautiful young women you were just describing. And it, I don't know that it has changed that much today. I think that there are a lot of really, really good guys who still feel the same way. They don't feel that they have a shot at the type of woman that you were um, 
just describing. And they're good guys. They're very good young men. Mm -hmm. um, they are competing with the young men who may appear to have the look and they have the swag and, you know, they have that, you know, um, the charm, um, as we used to call it back in the day. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're any more together on the inside. You know, they're just as um, concerned about how they are going to show up once you get past the initial appearances. And that's why communication is so important. You, you can't judge a book by its cover. That still rings true today. I mean, you just you can't. So we need to get back to just having basic conversations so we'll know who we are as we interact with other people. And, and one thing is you mentioned all this. I'm reminded of this image of the bad boy. You know, it just seems to be an attraction for such young women. In fact, uh, I uh, make no mistakes. Some people who've known me and have heard me over the years, I always talk about my side hustle in real estate. I happen to have a client right now who's a millennial, and mm -hmm. I see what she unfortunately has uh, uh, has has a living situation with a what I would perceive as a bad boy, and she's getting misadvice, and I can't do anything other than to be respectful on the outside. But mm -hmm. it just saddens me when I see young women, you know, capitulating to someone who is abusive and, uh, and, and maybe, and may not be physically abusive, but mentally, you mm -hmm. know, how, how do you stop that from happening? I mean, it's, I know it's an esteem issue, but I just see it so often with a lot of young people, particularly women. Yeah, yeah, and and I I will say that you know the um, attraction to um, the bad boy doesn't necessarily stop when you get to be a certain age because I know a lot of more seasoned women who still you know are drawn to that. Um, I really just think it has to do with you know where you are within yourself and what you are and are not willing to accept and allow to come into your life. You know, when you're really good with you, it's easier to be at peace with yourself whether you have someone or not number one and number two when you have um certain standards for your life and you you know you want someone to come into your life who's going to kind of mirror who you are i think that a lot of times you know we have um unrealistic expectations of other people because we want them to you know bring that joy and happiness in or whatever it is that we're wanting when it really starts in inside. So, so I would say to any young woman, I just had that situation, um, you know, come up in my life recently when I was talking to a young woman who called me out of the clear blue, I hadn't talked to her for some time and she FaceTimed me one night and I answered the call and I didn't recognize her. Um, you know, a young man had hit her in the eye. I did not recognize mm, her. Mm. And she went on to describe different aspects of their relationship. And she just said, you know, I'm at a point now where I don't want, I don't know what to do. So I said, well, let's just talk about you. Let's take him off the table. Let's take guys off the table right now. Let's just talk about where you are within yourself. And um, she agreed that she was just going to go on a, you know, what we called a, a man diet for like six months to almost a year. You know, because she needs to focus on pulling herself together and stop looking for your ability to be complete or happy or whole based on something outside of yourself. We, we have to get back to our inner core. Um, and I think social media continues to draw us away from who we are and bring the world in. And it's not always um, the, in, the outcome is not always good for a lot of people, regardless as to whether they're male or female. And, and you just hit a responsive chord because as, as you know, and again, I don't know the nature of the, the person you're just speaking of, but there seems to be an element out here where, and, it, and it's not something new either, where couples will stay together even if the situation is bad for them. How do you correct mm -hmm. that? So I think that a lot of times we just have to be attuned to what the other person in our life is telling us. Many times people are saying in their own way, his or her own way, I really don't want to be here anymore. You know, I don't, this is not working. And it, it's not always because the person who is receiving that message has done something um, wrong. It could be that the other person is just ready to move on. 
I think that when we try to hold on to things that um, no longer serve us well, um, and we just want to hold on to it because, you know, this is like a bird in the hand. You know, I, I have this person or I think I have this person and the, the person is really ready to go. It makes for a, a really toxic um, situation. And I've seen that happen a lot of times. Um, I've had a lot of young men. And again, I, I, I love I love my guys, you know, who have said, you know, every time I get ready to tell her how I feel, she starts crying. And so then I feel like I have to stay. Um, because I don't want to hurt her feelings, but I just don't want to be here. Everybody who comes into your life isn't supposed to be there for a lifetime. Um, we have to be able to read the signs. So in the book, one of the first things I do is encourage young women to just before you, you pour your heart out and into someone you don't know, take some time and pay attention to who the person is. If you just hold on and just watch to see what he's like, what he's saying, how he's conducting himself, um, paying attention to his social media, you may discover that he really isn't good for you. Like he might not be a good fit for you and you might not be a good fit for him and that's okay. Discover that early on and say, okay, I'm open to another possibility and move on instead of trying to make something or make someone be whom they can't be for you. That makes a lot of sense. So, so basically, give me a thumbnail sketch as to how long should someone uh, try something out, and, and would that involve physical involvement? You know, beyond kissing. You know, I in terms would, of I wouldn't encourage it. So what I what I tell the young ladies is to just give it thirty days, and they scream and holler, thirty days! Oh my god, that's a long time. <laughs> You know, he'll leave me if I, I said, well, you know, if, if he if he leaves you in a 30 day period, then he probably isn't the right person for you in the first place. Right. But at this point, you're not talking about being with or without. You're just getting to know who the person is. Mm -hmm. You know, how is he talking to you? How does he look at you? Um, what is his conversation like? What are his goals and ambitions? Um, you know, is he working? Is he not working? Does he want to work? Um, would he prefer to be taken care of, you know, is he able to take you out, you know, um, or do you always have to pay every single expense? And that's no judgment. I'm just saying that, you know, a lot of young women want someone who's going to be able to take them out to eat or take them wherever and, you know, not have to always pay. If they come to an agreement as to how they're going to make that work, sometimes I'll pay, sometimes you pay, that's fine. But I'm just saying, you know, the first 30 days without any intimacy, because intimacy tends to affect, impact. It changes the flavor. Judgment. It does. It really, <laughs> really does. So just wait. You're you, are, you should be worth it to yourself to wait. Mm -hmm. Hold on to yourself and wait. And I tell the guys the same thing. You know, she looks good. She smells good. And you have all these visuals in your head about the possibilities of whatever. But you don't know her. You don't mm -hmm. you don't know her. Slow your roll. Slow down. Give it some time. And you might find that whew, you know, I dodged a bullet on that one, you know, because it could turn out to be something wonderful or it could turn out to be a disaster. But only time will tell. You can't rush it. I've seen that. And I, <laughs> I you know, all those, uh, I'm not even going to go there. I was going to get uh, personal for a minute. But one thing I will say that I find uh, interesting in your book, you have a chapter devoted to how one breaks up, you know. And um, I, I just, for you, if you could just recount what you've written about that. And, and I know the process isn't easy. A lot of people... Today, I noticed that they text and say, it's over, goodbye. Well, I'll say this, if, if you ever cared for an individual, then I personally think that you should honor that individual by having a conversation in person about why it's no longer working for you. Um, because anything else is, is I, I think, disrespectful. You know, and you have to pay attention um, and that's a collective you, of course, I'm just talking to, you know, whoever's listening, mm -hmm. pay attention to what is and is not happening in the relationship you're in. You know, I believe that people should check in with each other every now and again, just to make sure, you know, everybody is good. You know, um, what are your thoughts and feelings about, you know, 
are continuing in in this in this uh, vein. You know, are, are you still feeling good? Are we still friends? I mean, you know, if if there's some corrective action we need to take, you know, what might that be? Because in the absence of that conversation, um, you know, folks are just kind of coasting along, and they look up and they're at a place where they never thought they would be. So I think that we have to pay attention to um, not only to the person with whom we're involved, but pay attention to ourselves because people change. And if you're not growing with the person, then the opposite of that would be that you're growing apart. And sometimes that happens in life, but, you know, end it gracefully. You don't have to curse anybody out. You know, I don't think that, um, you know, um, your growth should come at someone else's expense. So have a conversation and conversation should be ongoing in any relationship, even in friendships, just talk. Um, that's the only way you're going to know where the other person's head is and you get the feedback that you need so that you'll know what steps you need to take moving forward. So in other words, you're, you're saying that it, it, it's a gradual process and you, you mentioned the fact that uh, there should be some sort of physical contact as a matter of respect. Because uh, just recently, I, I had to sever ties with someone I was very close to. It wasn't a romantic relationship, but it was mm -hmm. uh, it, it dealt with business. And it bothered me because I knew this person so long, but this person could not get past the point of my reasons why I needed the time to devote to mm -hmm. things that I was going through. And sometimes that may not be enough. How do you handle that? Well, you know, we, we, we are not always fixers for other people's concerns. You know, all we can do is be our authentic selves and be honest and truthful. We can't control how other people respond to what we say and how we feel. We just can't. And that's not something I think anyone should have to own. All we can do is show up, tell the truth, be honest, and maybe give some explanation as to why. And that's all we can do. If, if they mm. don't receive what we're saying to them, what can we do about that? I, it's just, I, I personally, I think it's out of our control. I just think that we should honor that other person and just tell them, you know, candidly and in a loving way, if possible, when I say loving, I'm just saying, you know, um, from it the blurs heart. the line. No, I understand yes. what you're saying. I was just going to say yes. it blur the line sometimes. Yes, you know. exactly, exactly. And, and that's all we can do. Because everyone is not meant to be together for <laughs> forever mm -hmm. in any type of relationship. It just it, it isn't always meant to be. I think it's really cool when everybody can acknowledge it and say, hey, I do understand. Sometimes you'll get a, you know, I've been feeling that way for a long time myself. And I didn't know how to tell you. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. And other times you get pushback, but but we, we can't manage everybody else's growth. Mm hmm. We just can't do it. Are people, men, men and women, are they, is in, in your estimation, in your research, do you think there's ever a, a situation where men and women stay together forever? I mean, with, you know, is that is that something impossible to think of? Or I grew up in an environment like that. So anything alien to that is is like, you know, abnormal. Yeah, I think that there are people who get married and they, if that's what you're asking me, who stay yeah. together forever. Yeah, my, my grandparents were married for 77 years. I'm like, oh, I don't know how. I know. But they did it. Mm. Uh, my, my parents were together over 50 years. You know, that was kind of the trend in my family until, you know, several years later when some of us began to say, I really just, I can't. It's mm. not working for me. A lot of people stay because it's part of a tradition you know, uh, an expectation of some people somewhere uh, of, of staying in a relationship. Some people stay because they are just too afraid to be alone. Mm. And I would rather stick with what I have than to, you know, be just good with who I am. And that's why I'm saying, you know, it really starts with being good with you. Just, just think about it for a moment. If everyone shows up to another person and they're good with who they are, what a, an amazing jumping off point to move forward into whatever it may be. If I show up and I'm wanting someone to fix me, if I'm showing up and I, it puts a lot of burden on the other person because they may not be any more together than I, first of all. Mm. And so it just depends on 
the blend that comes together early on. But I, 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 I've seen people say I have friends who've been married for many, many, many years and they found a way to make it work. And I've known of a number of people who have said, you know, I really want to live a full life and I can't live the way I want to live right now with you because we're just on two different pages and that's okay. It's okay. It's right. okay. The key is to be honest about it and say, this really isn't working. And I, I don't dislike you. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't dislike you. I, I want, I want, cause I, I loved you at one point. So I want you to be okay in your life. It just can't be with me. Right. And, and I agree with you. I mean, I don't understand the phenomenon where, where, you know, couples stay together forever for no reason, knowing that they don't necessarily agree with what the other person, I mean, people will have disagreements, but to mm -hmm. the point where you're, you know, stepping out behind a person. The other day I got a phone call from a friend of mine and she happily married, supposedly happily married, but she got on the phone with me and she was whispering. I said, well, so-and-so, why are you, I, I can't hear what you're saying. I, you know, well, I can't talk right now. My husband is home. I said, well, I know him. Well, I can't repeat what I'm saying. You know, I mean, I don't understand that. You know, you're talking to me. I'm not looking to do anything other than be respectful. You yes. know, but uh, yeah. it it's just amazing. And and uh, Michelle, we're almost out of time here. I wanted to get into the whole issue of branding and tattoos that seem to be a phenomenon <laughs> today. But we'll save that for another segment, you know. Absolutely. I'll come back whenever you have me back. Thank yeah. you so much for allowing me to share with you today. Same here. And I'm, I'm really honored for you to come this way all the way from Detroit. The big D, as I'm Absolutely. told. And, yes. uh, you know, we'll have you back again. Uh, Michelle Parazon, author, educator, and uh, sociologist, if I may <laughs> add. <laughs> Thank you again Thank you. for being on The Urban Algorithm. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, you too. And that wraps and ties this edition of the show for this week. This is the Our World Media Network. Stay tuned.